Michael Anthony Perutka, co-founder of the Institute on the Constitution, was the Constitution Party's 2004 candidate for President of the United States. Michael currently serves as an elected member of the County Council for Anne Arundel County, Maryland, and he continues to speak and teach across the country about law and government. This Constitution was intended for a moral and a religious people. Yes. It's wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. Let me quote John Adams again, our second president, and somebody who was very involved in the, the uh, adoption of the Declaration of Independence. This, he's talking about the Constitution. This Constitution was intended for a moral and a religious people. It's wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. I'm gonna come back to John Adams in just a moment, but let me just pause and thank Rusty Thomas, Pastor Thomas, and, uh, and Pastor Bob, who, uh, the Word of Life Church here, and uh, my colleague, David Whitney, um, uh, who's uh, my pastor, pastor of Cornerstone Church in Annapolis, Maryland, who came with me out here, and he's uh, our senior instructor at the Institute on the Constitution. I'm going to thank a gentleman named Kyle back here. I don't even know his last name, but he made he made it he made it happen so that our PowerPoint is going to work and and did all the electronical miracles uh, to make that happen. I want to thank Pastor Matruella for his wonderful words. I was going to leave early, but he caught start talking about this Peruca guy, and I thought I'd stay around and see if he was really that good. He was really that good. I'm very grateful to you, Pastor, and uh, Chet Gallagher and others that uh, that I have worked with here. Um, uh, I have a very simple, specific task tonight, and that's to make a legal argument. And uh, But more to the point, my task is to get you to be able to articulate that legal argument. Mm. That's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to yeah. try to do it very briefly. But first of all, you might wonder, how did Peruka get to Wichita? What's Peruka doing here? Well, back last uh, September, I, I had the great privilege of speaking uh, at the rally for the clerk, Kim Davis, and you know, Kim was the clerk who refused to give the license to the people of the same sex, a marriage license to people of the same sex, and she was persecuted for that, and there was a rally there, and I got a call from this guy. <laughs> Recognize this guy? Um, one of the usual suspects, right? Uh, Cal is a good friend of mine and has been for about 20 years, and Cal called me on a Friday, I think it was. He might have called me Thursday night, but we spoke Friday morning. And he said at 11 o'clock tomorrow morning, that being Saturday, there's a rally here in Kentucky, and I want you here, and I can give you 10 minutes to talk. <laughs> he said, Michael, you only have 10 minutes, and you have, by the way, you have 25 hours to get here, and it took about 14 hours to drive there. And he said, you have 10 minutes to talk, and in that 10 minutes, I want you not so much to do something, but to undo something. I want you to undo 170 years of indoctrination by government schools. I want you to undo 150 years of indoctrination of legal profession by law schools. And I want you to undo 75 years of indoctrination by TV and major media, not to mention the United States federal government. <laughs> so I said, sure. <laughs> And I actually think I only, I mean, and I might, I, I want you to check me on this, I think I only used eight and a half minutes that morning. I was so scared I was going to go over time. <laughs> but in that eight and a half minutes, uh, I, uh, I tried to make this case. I said that Kim Davis has broken no law. Amen. Uh, and principally because there is no law, there was no law, and there could never be any law which would require her to issue a marriage license to same-sex couples. Contrary to popular belief at that time, the Supreme Court opinion and the ruling in o Obersfeld versus Hodges is not, was not, and never will be a law. Amen. So therefore, so therefore, that took about six minutes. Then in, then in two minutes, I tried to talk to the local officials there, the jailer, the sheriff, the local police, and tried to make the point is to them that since they're, and by the way, I am a local legislator in Maryland, I tried to speak to them and say, there is no law requiring you to hold this lady, so let her go. Yeah. Either sh And then the, the, the rally ended with the idea of either show me the law or free Kim Davis. Show me the law or free Kim Davis. Show me the law or free Kim Davis. Amen. And so that was, uh, that was my eight and a half minutes. Cal said, that, get off the stage. <laughs> That's enough. 
Then I get a call from this guy. Recognize this guy? <laughs> Pastor Rusty Thomas, who, who, I, who I met at that rally, later invited me to come here to Wichita, and he said, listen, you only have 45 minutes. <laughs> And by the way, I looked on the schedule when I got here and I had been reduced to 30 minutes. <laughs> and in that 30 minutes, I want you to undo <laughs> 170 years of indoctrination by government schools, 150 years of indoctrination of the legal profession by what are called law schools, and 75 years of indoctrination by TV and major media, not to mention the United States federal government. I said, no problem. <laughs> I could hit that pitch. I did it in eight and a half minutes. I'm sure I can do it. I can do it. I tried to do it anyway, by the grace of God. Anyway, I don't, I don't want to sound too puffed up here. Let me tell you that this is my objective tonight, okay? My cousin Neil, who, is, who works at the Institute on the Constitution with me, says, always have an objective. You've got to have an objective. You've got to state it. Okay, so here's my objective. I want to present the issue of what law is and what law isn't in a manner so straightforward and so clear that the audience, that's you, will be able to articulate and effectively communicate the truth to family and community and the culture. Amen. And in that way, we together will undo 170 years of indoctrination by government schools, 150 years of indoctrination of the legal profession by what are called law schools, I went to one, um, and 75 years of indoctrination of by TV and the major media, not to mention the United States federal government. So, at the heart of this argument is the idea, the truth, that the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States is not law. Mm -hmm. This argument, this legal argument, is central to why Kim Davis was an oath keeper, not a lawbreaker, and before you leave here today, as I said, I hope you will understand this legal argument and be fully able to articulate it persuasively. But first, I have to pause because I'm worried about time. What I'd like to what I'd like to explain is that in addition to being a local legislator where I come from, in addition to be a teacher of the Constitution, I also happen to be an amateur musician. Now I've got to when I introduce what I'm going to do here. I got to let you know. I'm no Doc Johnson. I'm, I don't. I don't write screenplays. I don't make movies. I don't have ten kids. I, 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 I'm, th I'm not a professional at this. This was my first music video. But after coming back from uh, the experience at the Kim Davis rally in Kentucky, I did what I sometimes do. God puts on my heart. I wrote a song. Now, how many people remember like? Um, who, who's old enough to remember Buddy Holly and the Crickets, okay? Or Buddy Holly and the Crickets, right? Well, this is kind of in that genre, okay? And I'd like to play it for you. I'd like to play it for you now. I made a little music video out of it. You might recognize some of the people in the video. But this, it's just in case I don't get to my final point, this is the end of my talk. I'll come back in the middle. Okay? Just in case time runs out, okay? Courts do not make law. There's a battle going on, a war for your soul It's a devil's deal, it's mind control They want you to believe that you have no hope They're counting on the fact that you are a dope Well, they tell you the rules, tell you what to eat They know that you won't question, they know that you don't read We've lived a lie for way too long It's time to know right from wrong No matter what they told you all Judges cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Congress makes the laws and the courts make none. That's in the Constitution, it's in Article 1. Look it up, read the words, use your own two eyes. Know it well, mark the spot, have it memorized. Tell your children, tell your mama, tell your family, tell your friends, tell your neighbors if you want to be free. You won't learn the truth in government schools. It's up to you to know the rules, no matter what they told you all. Courts and judges cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. 
mistake law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Oh, Dred Scott was not law. You see, they ignored the court then, and so should we. The slaughterhouse and Mickey Mouse and Roe v. Wade. Opinions are not how law is made. That's not the way that our founders planned. Now wise up and rise up across the land. Spread the word so everybody knows this emperor has got no clothes no matter what they told you all. Courts and judges cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. Courts cannot make law. The case law method has a fatal flaw because courts cannot make law. disagreement about how big this podium is. Just say we're... He says that this is uh, uh, 30 inches across, and I say it's no more than 27 inches across. So then let's say that uh, we're going to ask Rusty to be our judge. He's going to judge the matter between us. He's going he's to settle it for us. What does Rusty have to bring with him to the podium? He needs a, well, you all said the right answer, a tape measure, a ruler, a yardstick. He needs some fixed standard, does he not? He needs some fixed standard to measure whether this thing, what, what this thing is, okay? So, I have in my hand a pamphlet, in addition to the Bible, in addition to the Bible, I have a pamphlet here in the Bible that has the U.S. Constitution in it. I have the yardstick. What I want to visibly display to you is that these are the yardsticks. This, uh, Rusty talked about this last night, and I'm going to expound on it just a little bit. The, the, uh, there's, a, there's an internal standard. That's the Bible. That's God's Word. That's divine law. That's the eternal standard for what law is. Amen. Right? There's also... What, the, what we have allowed our government, because by consent of the government, what we've agreed that they can do, and that's the United States Constitution, okay? So here's the two standards. That This is important, I want you to remember that visibly, that without that standard, we don't know what law is, and we don't know what law isn't. And that's the problem, is it not? No. So, yeah. the legal argument. Let's make the, this is, this. is we're gonna talk about the, the, the temporal standard now, not the eternal standard, but the temporal standard here. We're going to talk about the Constitution. Very first sentence of the United States Constitution, after the preamble, the very first sentence, Article 1, Section 1, says all... Hmm. Let's just stop right there. The very first word in the Constitution is the word all. What does all mean? I once had a teacher that said all means all, and that's all all means. Right? All means all. Each and every. Right? Okay, so the rest of the sentence says this. All legislative powers here and granted shall be vested in the Congress of the United States. Now, I just asked, I asked this question at the Kim Davis rally. If all lawmaking power is in Congress, how much is left over for the courts? Just, just do the math, right? There's, there's, a little, there's a little math problem there. If all lawmaking powers in Congress, how much is left over for the courts? None. Zero. Absolutely zero, none, not a zip, goose egg, none, right? By the way, if all lawmaking powers in Congress, how much is left over for executive orders by the president? Same answer, none, zero. So now you know. That's it. That's as complicated as it is. Now you know the temporal argument about why courts cannot make law and about why Oberstfeld versus Hodges, whatever it is, it's not law. Okay? That's the temporal or the horizontal argument. But there's more. There's also the eternal. There's the Bible. There's God's word. There's the vertical argument. Now, 
I only have minutes left, so let's talk quickly. <laughs> to understand this eternal argument, let's talk briefly about the Declaration of Independence, okay? On this slide, I've taken the Declaration of Independence and printed it out on four pages, and they're even color-coded for you, right? Now, the reason I did it this way is to show you that, really, if you read the Declaration, about three-quarters of the document is just a list of complaints. Yeah. It's a list of grievances against the king and, against, and, and indirectly against Parliament. So, it's, and, uh, by some people's count it as 27 and some people count it as 28, but most of the document is a list of grievances. And I'm going to suggest to you that it's, if that's all it was, if it was just a list of 27 complaints, then it would be lost to history. You and I would not know about it. You would not know the, any of the words to it. It would, it would not be important. And as I say, it would have been lost to history. Because let me ask you to consider, if you've got 27 complaints against the king, but the king is the ultimate lawgiver. There's no appeal. Whatever comes out of the mouth of the king is the law, and it can change today and tomorrow. Tune in tomorrow. It's something else. If that's your situation, if the king is the ultimate lawgiver, then what does it matter if you have 27 complaints? Or 127 complaints? Or 8,027 complaints? Does it make any difference? No. Because you're, you're up against the sovereign. So, that was the situation for our founders. So on that first page, that yellow page there, they made a legal argument. And that legal argument basically said, wait a minute, there's a lawgiver above the king. Yeah. Yeah. That the king owes allegiance to. And that the king owes fealty to, right? There's a lawmaker above the king. And they did it in language that's so wonderful and so precise and concise that probably somewhere in your youth, somebody thought it was important for you to memorize it, so they made you memorize it, so that when I say it now, you'll probably say it with me, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men have evolved equal. Yeah. Just seeing if you're paying attention. Just seeing if you're still there with me. Okay, they didn't say all men have evolved equal, did they? They said all men are created equal, which is a vastly different concept with vastly different uh, circumstances and vastly different conclusions, right? So what they were presupposing by saying all men are created equal, what do you have to presuppose to make that statement? But there's, well, actually, not only that there's a creator, but there was a creation. Right? That presupposes both of those things, does it not? So the very first presupposition contained in this legal argument in the Declaration was there is a God. Hmm. They went on. They said they're endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So they said that our rights are not privileges of government, but that they are gifts of God. They're part of His created order. So the very two first two presuppositions is there is a God and our rights come from Him. But they went on. You know, in ele we're in election season now, right? We're kind of always in election season. But when somebody walks up your driveway or knocks on your door or sends you a piece of mail, or calls you on the phone and asks you for your vote or your money or some sort of support because they're running for office, I think a very fair question to ask them is what's the purpose of government? Mm. Mm. And then just please shut up, don't help them. Just, just say, what's the purpose of civil government? And you will get a whole range of crazy answers about baseball fields and all, all, all kind of socialist nonsense. But what did Jefferson say the purpose of government was? That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. So the purpose of civil government is not to make sure you're wearing your helmet nope. or that your seatbelt is buckled. Amen. And it's also not to take money from you because you have it and give it to you because you need it. That's not the purpose of civil government. Redistribution of wealth is not the purpose of government. The purpose of government is to protect God-given rights. And it presupposes that there is a God. And as Rusty said the other night, if you take God out of the equation, then you, there's no such thing as God-given rights, are there? Nope. All right, so. The conclusion in the Declaration of Independence is this. There is a God, our rights come from Him, and the purpose of civil government is to protect God-given rights. 
Let's say this together, class. Number one, there is a God. There is a God. Our rights come from Him. The purpose of civil government is to protect God-given rights. That is the American view. You just described the American view. At Institute on the Constitution, we spent 20 years describing and teaching and offering courses so that people can understand these concepts and articulate them well. Now, it's not just a fancy philosophical principle. It's the law. It's the law in America. The U.S. Code says the Declaration of Independence is the organic law of the United States. Now think about that a minute. This is the law, and it's the organic law of the United States. So I'm going to suggest to you that any, anything that purports to be law, that's not in harmony with it, is not law. So, so this is the law. So what, we're, what we need to understand is that this eternal argument, this eternal argument, this eternal standard, is the American standard. It's the law in America. It still is and always will be. Yeah. All right, let's talk about this. We, you hear people all the time saying things like Obamacare is now the law of the land. Or you hear people say Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, don't you? You hear that phrase. Yeah. Our founders would have laughed at that. As a matter of fact, in this document, in the Declaration of Independence, they were, they were arguing against the Stamp Act, the Tea Act, what they called the Townsend Acts, and the Intolerable Acts, the things that Parliament were doing, was doing without any authority, <coughs> like Obamacare, right? Right? And what they called these things was pretended legislation. Please say that with me. Pretended legislation. That's what they called things that were not law, and they knew they weren't law, because they could tell the difference because they knew they didn't meet these two standards. So if things, things, something doesn't meet these two standards, it's not law, it can't be law. It's pretended legislation. I suggest we adopt their term. Not only is it a start, but it's very accurate, is it not? Mm. Pretended legislation, that's what they called this. They said he has, by talking about the king, he has combined with others, the others, his parliament, to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts, that's parliament, of pretended legislation. They didn't call things like Obamacare law. All right, so how do we recognize pretended legislation when we see it? Well, Rusty gave you, I'm, I'm gonna go quickly here because Rusty helped you with this last night. We've already talked, it's gotta be, it's gotta meet this standard. Well, that means it's gotta, it's gotta meet the law of nature. And, he, and Rusty talked to you about uh, Sir William Blackstone. Blackstone said, man, considered as a creature, must necessarily be subject to the laws of his creator. For he is an entirely dependent being. It is necessary that he should, in all points, conform to his maker's will. This is a legal argument. And, the, and it concludes with the will of the maker. It, this will of the maker, the will of the sovereign, the ultimate sovereign of the universe, is called the law of nature. This law of nature, dictated by God himself, is superior in obligation to any other. It is binding over all the globe in all countries, at all times. No human laws are of any validity if contrary to this. That's to the law of God, and, and again, I've tried to make the, 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 the argument to you, this is the law in America, all right? Well, and, and then he, uh, the, the language that Blackstone used, law of nature and revealed law, Jefferson in the Declaration said the law of nature and nature's God, he just, he uh, used a slightly different way to express it, but he got it, he, he, was, he was copying Blackstone here. Yeah. The doctrines thus delivered, we call the revealed or divine law, and they are to be found only in the Holy Scriptures. So, test A, again, is the Bible. Test A, the eternal standard for, for law is God's word. Test B, if you will, the temporal standard for law is the Constitution. Or, if you're in my case, uh, I'm, a, I'm a local legislator, I have to obey the, the Constitution of the State of Maryland and the Charter of Anne Arundel County, of which, where I serve and to, under, to which I've taken an oath. So, if we want to determine if something is or is not law, we must apply the standards. Well, let's apply the standard for a second just to Roe v. Wade, because this is a very important case to us, is it not? Yeah. Okay, let's take the test B, the, the, let's take the horizontal standard, the, the temporal standard first. What is Roe v. Wade, folks? What is it? 
It's a, it's a quote, yeah, and, and right, it doesn't say law at the top of the page, it says opinion, doesn't it? What, it's a, and where did it come from? It, it came from the Supreme Court. What, and so which branch of government is that? Right, judicial. So how much how much lawmaking authority does the judicial branch have? Zero. Zero. Right, very good. That's that math problem we did, right? So that's not the branch that can make law? So what would our founders have called Roe v. Wade? Pretended legislation. And as a matter of fact, it's not even legislation. Right? It's not even it's not even that. In Norton v. Shelby County back in back in the 1880s, our, our Supreme Court said, and I'm not quoting the Supreme Court now because they're always right. I'm quoting now because they were right this time. Okay? They said this, an unconstitutional act is not law. Okay? Roe v. Wade, therefore, is not law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties. It affords no protection. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation as though it had never been passed. So it is a nullity. As, as uh, one, of, one of the precepts Rusty talked about was, Roe v. Wade is a legal fiction. Well, it's, it, it, is a, it is in fact a nullity. It is at best pretended legislation. So what do you do with that? Well, you resist it, and if you are in a, in a position of authority, like, like Cal was saying, one of the things we need to do is, that, is to, is to uh, take dominion over these positions of civil authority, because if we don't, then, then they're ceded to the pagans, right? So. We, we, need, we need, like for example, a governor of Kansas or Maryland or Wisconsin or whatever, or attorney general to have the fortitude to stand up to, to and say, that I don't care what the Supreme Court says, that's not law here because we in Kansas know what the law is because we've read it. Yeah. We're familiar with it. Right? So, Let's take the, uh, the ultimate standard, the, uh, uh, the eternal standard. What does the Bible say about the taking of innocent life? Exodus 20, 13 says that, that you know, that shall not murder. So, but let's take, for example, what if Roe v. Wade, what if the legislature, what if the Congress did pass a law allowing abortion? And then no. what if, assume the president signed it and assume Doesn't the court matter. validated it. Would it be the law? No. No, no, of course not. But we need to know that and we need to we need to in, enforce that because it has to pass both tests in order to, to, uh, to meet the standard. It has to meet both standards in order to be a valid law. If we want to determine if something is or, not, is or is not law, obviously we've made the point, you've got to apply the standards. But to apply the standards, what do you have to do? You've got to know the standards. You have to know the standards, right? Mm -hmm. So the more we know the Bible and the Constitution, the more equipped we are to guard our liberty and to pass the blessings of our liberty to our posterity. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to do this again, and, and, and Pastor Dave is going to give you a, just a short little commercial for some of the things we do at, at Institute on the Constitution and that you might be able to take, uh, take the benefit of. Um, so in, the more we know these things, the, the, the better we're prepared to defend our liberties and to understand and to know the difference, what's a law and what's not a law, okay? I want to suggest to you that you can't conquer a Christian people. A biblical literate people cannot be conquered because they'll see it coming. Amen. They'll see it coming. So, and, and we were, I, I believe we were once a, bibli a biblically literate people in America. Yeah, we were. we were. So, you can't conquer a biblically literate people. So what do you have to do if you want to conquer them? Make them illiterate. You have to, to de-Christianize them. Yeah. That's right. And then you can conquer them, or rather, they really will have conquered themselves. Yep. Right? Not? But say it for, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge, because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, and I will also forget thy children. Mm. Back to John Adams, he said, this constitution is intended for a moral and religious people wholly inadequate for the governance of any other. If we want our constitution and our laws in America to work, we have to be a moral and religious people, right? So what do we need? This comes back to where we started. We need revival! There's a battle going on, a war for your soul. It's a devil's deal. It's mind control. They want you to believe that you have no hope. They're counting on the fact that you are a dog. Well, they tell you the rules, tell you what to eat. They know that you won't question. They know that.
you don't read We've been alive for way too long It's time to know right from wrong No matter what they told you all Courts and judges cannot make law The case law method has a favorite law Because courts cannot make law Courts cannot make law Courts cannot make law The case law method has a fatal flaw Because courts cannot make law Congress makes the laws and the courts make none That's in the Constitution, it's in Article 1 Look it up, read the words, use your own two eyes Know it well, mark the spot, have it memorized Tell your children, tell your mama, tell your family Tell your friends, tell your neighbors if you wanna be free You won't learn the truth in government schools It's up to you to know the rules No matter what they told you all Courts and judges cannot make law The case law method has a fatal flaw Because courts cannot make law Courts cannot make law Courts cannot make law The case law method has a fatal flaw Because courts cannot make law But Dred Scott was not law You see, they ignored the court then And so should we Slaughterhouse and Mickey Mouse and Logie Wade Opinions are not how law is made That's not the way that our founders planned Now wise up and rise up across the land Spread the word so everybody knows This emperor has got no clothes No matter what they told you all Courts and judges cannot make law The case law method has a fatal flaw Because courts can Thank you.